Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Everybody, all together. Good morning. Good morning. So, first question: Can you hear me without a handheld mic? Yes. yes. Can the people in the back of the room hear me without a handheld mic? Yes. Good. So, if it starts to change, let me know. If I start to lose my voice, I'll grab the mic. So, um, let me ask you a question: How many of you would like to know the secret? to making big money in small business during good times and bad? Show of hands. And if you knew that secret, how many of you would be willing to begin to implement those tools this week? Right now. All right, let me say it again, because I barely see those hands up there. All right, well, you've come to the right place. I'm Stuart Welch, and I am looking forward to talking to you about how to make big money in small business during good times and bad. Now, first of all, I want to thank Billy for having me here. Uh, I love to come and talk about my favorite subject, money. And it actually reminds me of a story. This, uh, the teenager was granted an audience with God. And they told him, you get to ask three questions. So the first question was, God, what is a million years like to you? And God says, it's like one second. He said, well, God, what is a million dollars like to you? He says, it's like one penny. This kid being very industrious, he says, God, would you give me one penny? And God says, sure, son, just a second. <laughs> so you don't have to wait a second for this. What we're going to do is talk about how to make uh, uh, big money yeah, no matter what the environment is. Before I do, this is just a little sidebar. How many of you have the intention of uh, uh, accumulating enough wealth to see you through your retirement years? Let me see a show of hands. And uh, how many of you, that look like everybody, thank you, uh, how many of you would, as part of that intention, hope to, leave, hope to leave an estate to your children? How many of you would like that? <clears throat> okay, so uh, what I, how many of you would like to create, with that estate, a legacy that would provide a financial safety net for not only your children, but your grandchildren and perhaps your great-grandchildren. How many of you, just that concept has some appeal? So here's what I've done. Billy asked me to bring some of my books, and I've got about a dozen books over here. Uh, and in there, I've, these, are si these are signed copies. And what I've done is I've marked a particular section on a concept called a legacy trust. So when we're done, if you want a book, just come get it. And if they run out and you still want that book, if you'll get to Billy or get to me a business card and on the back of it, just write book on there, I'll make sure I send you a copy. So the concept of a legacy trust. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so um, would it be OK uh, to put my words in personal context? Would it be OK to tell you just a little bit something about my personal frame of reference? Would that be OK? Is that OK? Thank you. Uh, so I believe that this is just my personal belief, that God created the universe, and God created everything in it. And so everything in the universe is connected. It's like this universal soup. And every question, every answer to every question you have is right there for the taking. All you need to know is where to go and, or who to ask. And that's the context for what I believe. When I was 22, when I graduated from college, uh, and this happened about six months after I started working. Uh, I made a decision. I made a decision that I was going to become a millionaire by the age of 40. Now, you've got to go back in time, because 22, that was a long time ago. And a million bucks is a lot of money today, but back then it was really a big, big mountain. And I didn't really know how to do that. I had no background. I didn't know how to do that, but I did decide to do one thing that changed my life and set me on that course and allowed me to accomplish that goal. And that was I decided to study self-made millionaires. And I catched this idea, and the idea was that uh, I would interview them for a, a cable TV program. So I approached Birmingham Cable TV and said, I got this idea where I want to interview self-made millionaires and I want to find out their secret to success. And they said, well, that's kind of a cool idea. We'll do that. And so I did. So this was uh, back in the early 90s. And uh, here's what I learned. There are five things, there are five things that I want to share with you today. Three of them come directly out of uh, 
all of those interviews, when I kind of sifted through all of the interviews, it came down to three really core principles that create success in business. And I'm going to add two more on there that I've personally discovered uh, as part of this process. So uh, the first one is this. <clears throat> oh, by the way, I know uh, how many of you in here are uh, not business owners or not business owners? Let me just see a show of hands. Not business owners. Okay. so. Uh, I don't want to leave you out. So here's, here's why a lot of the comments that I'm going to make today apply to you directly. And it's going to apply to you in two really specific areas. One is when we're working with clients, we ask them to make a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift is we want you to think about your personal finances as if it were a business. It is a paradigm shift because most people don't think like that. Think of your personal finances as if it were a business. And in your personal financial life, you have revenue. True or true? True. OK, so and what you're trying to do is manage your revenue against your expenses. And assuming that something left over, what does it equate to? It allows you to grow your business, or in personal finance terms, that would be your net It would grow your net worth. So the concepts that I'm talking about today apply to personal finance as well. The second point would be uh, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about would apply to you. For if you've got a job, if you're working for somebody, here's the thing I would encourage you to do is to think like an owner. A lot of employees, most employees don't do that. Think like an owner. If you are an employee of Summer Classics, as an example, think about what your, not just your job, and how you would run that better if you were the owner, but think about the whole company and how things can, how you can impact that company with that. So I'm going to put that in that context. So let's start with, um, I want to start with a true story. And this is one of my interviews uh, that I did. And this guy, uh, uh, what I did was I would do a pre-interview, and then we'd go on TV and we'd do a, uh, the real interview. And basically what I would ask him is, what is the key to success? And this particular person, by the way, the, all of the people I interviewed were absolute incredible. The most famous person was uh, Steve Forbes. Everybody knows who Steve Forbes is? Forbes Magazine ran for president. Just a little side note. Uh, when I got through, he was unbelievable. I mean, you know, the interview with him was just like, this is the smartest guy I've ever met. And when we got through with the interview, or right toward the end of the interview, I said, Steve, your ideas are so brilliant, would you ever consider running for president? He said, oh, no, I would never do that. 30 days later, he announced he was running for president. So I don't know. Uh, I, I like to think that I launched this presidential campaign, but I don't think that was it. Uh, so I met this one guy, and he was, unbelievable person and here's his story he was at uh, he was at college and when he got the call and the call was that his father had passed away and so his father had a small business and in order to support the family he left college and went to run this business as you know like an 18 19 year old and this is now he's uh, 52 years old or early 50s when I was interviewing him and he had taken that business to right then at that point in time he was worth, personally worth, $60 million. So a guy that started from nothing out of college and takes it to $60 million, how many of you think he might have something to tell you? You want to listen when he talks. And so I asked him, I said, what is the key to financial success in the business? He said, it is three things. The first thing is you want to stay close to, and this, by the way, if you're taking notes, you might want to write these down. You want to stay close to your numbers. Stay close to your numbers. You want to stay close to your people, and you want to stay close to your customers. So stay close to your numbers, stay close to your people, stay close to your customers. So let me talk just a little bit about that. He went on to say, uh, he went on to say, Treat your company as if, as if it was a Fortune 500 company. And that was a completely new concept to me. And, uh, and here's, here's one, and I've been in the business for over 30 years, and I've seen lots and lots of businesses. And here's one of the major problems with businesses that don't do well, is they treat their business as if it's a personal checkbook. Now, those of you who own businesses, just kind of think about that 
Are you, uh, and, and what we'll see people doing is they're paying the country club bill out of it. Uh, you know, they're paying personal gasoline out of it. They're paying personal expenses. And then when they need a little money, they just go write a check out of it. And so when I left that interview, I decided right then and there I was going to do exactly what this guy told me because I thought he was very brilliant. And the first thing I did was I said, I'm going to treat my business, which I was treating as a personal checkbook, I'm going to treat my business as if it's a Fortune 500 company. So what do you think I would do different immediately? What do you think? Anybody? What might I do differently? Cut expenses, well, I think the uh, main thing I would do is monitor my expenses. So that would be the first thing. So I had not really, uh, I had not really kept my numbers. And so I said, well, the first thing a Fortune 500 company is going to do is they're going to get monthly reports, uh, monthly financial reports. So the first thing I did was I started doing monthly financial reports. By the way, the very first thing I did was I set myself up as a salaried employee. Does that make sense? Because I was just kind of taking money. What does the typical small businessman do in terms of getting income out of the company? Where do they get the money? They always take, thank you. They always take what's left over. And I said, well, that just doesn't make any sense. And so particularly in a Fortune 500 company. So the first thing I did was I started taking a small salary, and then I started measuring my numbers. And what, what has been so important about that, so right now, uh, and I know Billy does the same thing because I get monthly reports from Billy, uh, and he, and he manages his number. By the way, let me. Uh, I'm talking about the universe. The uni Here's what I've discovered: that the universe rewards action. So say that with me. The universe rewards what? Action. One more time, a little louder. The universe rewards what? Action. It rewards action. And one of the things that uh, you know, I've known Billy forever. One of the things I love about Billy is that uh, the other thing about the universe is basically the universe says if you can come up with the vision, I can help you develop the plan and then you've got to step through the door. And one of the things I love about Billy is Billy is truly a visionary. Billy, Billy started out as a furniture rep and he's built this huge company. Uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, but Billy, and I'm, Billy's probably told you this, but he bought this mega warehouse, or Hanley warehouse. That was an impossible deal to put together. That Billy just said, I'm going to keep going until I can't go any further. And he kept going long enough to put this mega deal together. It's going to make a huge difference in terms of summer classics and his business. So one of the little tricks, one of the little tips is attach yourself to a visionary and just hang on. And I think Billy's one of those people. The other thing, and this is another thing that I learned, and that is to, one of the things when I, uh, one of the things I was really good at, and most business owners are not. So if you're a business owner, or if you are an employee that has people working for you, I became a master delegator. So it was like, I would always, and, and if you talk to people in my company, they will tell you that I will delegate anything. And I will delegate it to people that don't think that they are ready. And what I found is if you show confidence in people, they will always rise to the occasion. And basically, the concept of delegation is, uh, what's your name? Donnie. Donnie. So I say, Donnie, I'm giving you this project. It is your project. If, here's the only rule, if you need help, if you run into a problem, raise your hand. Otherwise, go. Build it any way you want to build it. And what we have found is that Donnie and everybody like him will go out and they will run with that. So, uh, so today, I'm, uh, actually when I turned 60, it was quite a, uh, quite a uh, what's the word? Moment. It was quite a moment, thank you. It was quite a moment. So I got through the 30, the 40, the 50, but when 60 happened, it was like something happened. And uh, I said, you know, what am I going to do with the last third of my life? And I said, I, here's my commitment to me. I was going to commit to do a lot more of the things I like to do and a lot less of the things I didn't like to do. Fortunately, one of my tenants when I was building my company was I said, I want to build a company that doesn't revolve around me, that doesn't revolve around Stuart. I want to build a company that can run without me. And uh, here is the key to that. So if you want to know the key, this is a mistake a lot of business owners make. Uh, is they don't hire the very best people. So what is really key to that is you hire the best, the absolute best people you can, and you take a chance with it. I can remember hiring my first chief operating officer. 
And uh, I was not very good at managing people because I'm like really trusting and if you tell me something I just believe it and so everybody yeah it just wasn't working that good so I talked to an industrial psychologist and told, told him my problem he says you know you really need a COO and I've got just the person and this person came from big eight accounting background so he was gonna he was and I met him and he was like brilliant and he was also really what expensive so from my perspective I was really nervous about this but I decided to take a leap of faith on the concept of hiring the very best people you you can in fact my goal is to always hire people smarter than me now that turns out to be a fairly low bar but uh, <laughs> but I, I do that and, and here's been the key so now it's 62 years old I have a company that basically everybody else is running I'm free to do all the things that I like to do so I do only the things I like to do in the company, and I'm a big tennis player, so literally every day I play tennis. And uh, I'm basically living, and, and how long, when do you think you would retire if you had that situation? Never. 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 Is not retiring actually a pretty good retirement plan? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a great retirement plan if you're doing what you love. So part of it is to find what you love and move toward that. By the way, if you're an employee and there's something that you love, do you want to, and, and maybe you're stuck in something that you don't love, wouldn't it make sense to move toward that? And wouldn't it make sense to communicate that to employer? We had one of our employees the other day that came in, she was in an administrative position, said she wanted to move into, excuse me, a pair planner position. We said, you're on. And, we'll, and we've now started to build a team in to take her place. So don't let, uh, uh, if, if you're doing what you love, then you can do it for a really, really long time. All right, stay close to your people. Uh, oh, by the way, one other, just one other footnote. One of the things I did was I committed to building cash reserves. So I took 5% of gross income and said, I'm always going to put that in cash reserves. And the reason I did that was uh, I didn't, I wanted to, uh, for me personally, having money in the bank made me feel really, really comfortable. Most small business owners don't do that. They just kind of, at the end of the year, they take all the money out. Instead, I put all the money, I left money in, and I had a target. Now, in my case, it, because we're not a capital intensive company, it didn't have to be a really big number, but it was about $250,000. So I've got $250,000 sitting in the bank with no debt, and you think I'm pretty comfortable. You think I think I can weather a storm like 2008. And so that's been really helpful to me. So if you have a business, I would encourage you to do that. Second thing is uh, uh, stay close to your people. So tell me, just somebody, what, what is a way that you can stay close to your people? This is your associates, your employees. Anybody? What's an idea? Meetings. What? Meetings. meetings. You can do meetings. What else? Have lunch. Have lunch. Have lunch with them. So our COO has a not a it's not a set schedule, but he has throughout the year he is constantly taking one on one employees to lunch. What else? What else you think of? You what? Walk in the office and sit down and visit with them. Uh, and one of the things that we did was uh, we started a program that, uh, it's, you see this little thing, I, I'm not sure what to call it, a chip. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to catch people doing things right. And so we have this little program that if, uh, that any of the partners, if they find somebody in the, and we're looking for stuff, so as soon as we find somebody does something wrong, right, we give them one of these chips. And this chip, what we did was we built a, uh, we have a, 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 a thing that has a bunch of wrapped up presents. So like really nice stuff like, you know, dinner for two, 200 bucks or something. And once they get five of these chits, they get to go in there and pick a surprise. We don't, they don't know what it is, but it's in there. And you'd be surprised what it does to morale. I'll tell you one thing that we did, not everybody can do this, but we actually have lunch brought in every day. And so they're free to go out. But basically, for convenience, we had lunch brought in every day. And what I have found is that this group is super bonded uh, through sharing a meal. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> by the way, everybody, just in our company, everybody who is an advisor, comes in as advisor, is automatically on a partnership track. So one of the things we want to do is show them that they have a schedule of improvement. They know how they're going to move along. <laughs> so that creates a big incentive for them. So, so what are some ideas on staying close to your customer? Go see them. Go see them. All right, what else? And when you go see them, maybe <clears throat> would it always have to be a sales call? 
So just, is it really important to build a relationship with the customer? Yes. So I'm, I own a, a two financial advisory firms. They're, they're fee only, which means we don't sell stuff and we're really set up more like an accounting firm. But when we sit down with prospective clients, so a prospective client always has their money where? Somewhere else. They've always got it somewhere else. And so one of the questions we ask is why are you considering leaving? What do you think the number one reason is? No attention. No attention. They never, basically the way they'll say it is I never hear from my financial advisor. So we said, wow, that's easy. And what we did was we developed a computerized contact model. So it's every, and so is every client the same or is every client different? So is every customer different? So what we did is we just asked, how often would you like to be contacted? And, uh, and so whatever that was, we actually put it in the computer system and it pops up automatically so that we know to make a call on that customer. By the way, those aren't on, that, on our clients. Those are not sales calls because we don't do any selling. Uh, and, and, and every person there has the ability to take anybody to lunch or do anything they want to. By the way, one of the other things we did is we said, we want to celebrate client success. And so we literally are looking for opportunities to celebrate success. And everybody in the company is empowered to do whatever they think is appropriate for that particular client, for that particular situation. So I had one client who, was, uh, who won, he's a, a, a guy, and he won the uh, doubles nationals for his age group. Normally you wouldn't, you know, hey, congratulations, that's a good thing. But any opportunity to celebrate a success, we're going to do something. I don't remember what they sent them, but they sent him something. So uh, celebrate their success. Find out who they are. Find out what their uh, activities are. I know, uh, uh, I don't know if Frank Day's in here. Frank was, uh, Frank's here. He does some work with Billy. Frank doesn't have to be here. Frank is, can be doing something else. He's not required to be here, he's here because he's got a relationship with Billy. And so that's how you create those relationships. So um, stay close to your customers, stay close to your, so staying close to your customers uh, and staying close to people. So one of the things, uh, I, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. So, uh, <clears throat> so, so far we covered three things. Stay close to your numbers, stay close to your people, stay close to your customers. Let me talk about one other thing. I'm gonna talk about two other things. One other thing that really helped me and maybe would help you. So if you're a business owner or again in your personal finances, do you think, do you ever, now this is business owner for sure. As a business owner, do you ever worry about what's gonna happen in the future? Business owner, do you worry about that? No? Some no, okay, that's great. So I, I'm not a warrior. But as a business owner, I'm always thinking, well, what if this happened, what if that happened, what if this happened? And so one of the things that we did in times of prosperity, we sat down and wrote out a crisis management plan. A crisis management plan. And it, mine is right here. It's really short and really simple. But it basically says, and remember, I'm getting my numbers every month. True or true? True, thank you. I'm getting my numbers every month. So one of the advantages of getting your numbers every month and actually look, and by the way, those numbers are being measured against a month by month projection of what we expect our expenses to be. So it's really important that you have guessed, guessed what your expenses are gonna be, you've guessed what your revenues are gonna be, and then you're measuring the actuals against that. And the reason that's really important is you can spot a problem really early. So our report says if there's a difference between the actual and the projected, it's obviously gonna be positive or negative. Particularly if it's negative, we're sitting down and talking about why is that negative? Is that a problem that we need to solve or is a problem that's gonna be something that's uh, very temporary? But our crisis management plan says that, um, uh, let's see, that if we don't hit our numbers uh, two quarters in a row, we move into the crisis management plan. And it's a tiered plan. So who do you think takes the first haircut? <laughs> well, the partners. In our case, the partners. And so do you think that, do you think that we might have run into uh, a problem that we manage money? Do you think we might have run into a problem around 2008? From the, listen, from the, it was the worst bear market in the history of the market. 
uh, except for the Great Depression. And from the very top to the very bottom, from the peak to the trough of the 2008 crisis, the market was down, the stock market was down 57%, 57%. Our revenue is tied to the money that we're managing because we charge a fee for that. So you think we might have moved into crisis management? Yeah. But actually, because we did a really good job of managing money, we only moved to the first tier. So the first tier for us was not owner, not partner salary, but it was partner bonus. So our bonuses were not as much. So we made a little less than we did the year before. But let me tell you what the crisis management does. Now, was it Louise? What's, Leslie. Leslie. Leslie says she doesn't worry. Now I don't worry, and I don't worry because of two things. I got $250,000 in the bank, which buys me a lot of time. And secondly, I have a crisis management plan. If a crisis arises, I don't have to think about it when I'm all sweaty and worried about what's going on. I can move straight to that plan and say, all right, here's step one, step two, step three, and step four. Um, so it'll be different for every business. So the, the, that's, that's number four. The fifth thing is, is you should create your, you, what I call your unique difference, your unique difference. Uh, what is unique about your service or your product? And I like to use a couple of examples. Uh, there's a, this is a, a true story. This was a, a, a grocery bag boy. And the grocery bag boy was a, uh, he was a special needs person. And, uh, but, so he's just loading groceries at a grocery store, and he went home to his dad, and he said, Dad, I'd like to do, you know, I see all these people coming through the line, they don't, you know, I don't seem that happy. He said, I'd like to do something to try to lift them up. So he came up with an idea, and uh, they actually read the Bible every night, and so that what, what his dad did is he cut, he uh, typed up uh, verses from Proverbs. So everybody read Proverbs, you know, it's got a lot of really cool stuff in there. And so he, write up, he, he put them on a page, and his dad helped him cut them up. And then when people came through, he'd just fold one up and stick it in their grocery bag. You know, people coming through saw him do something, but they didn't really know what it was. They get home, they start unloading their groceries, and they open it up, and there was a little thing from Proverbs. And they were going, oh, wow, that's really cool. But here was the effect of that. Within about two weeks, what would happen is the manager would come in and there'd be this long line behind this checkout guy, behind this grocery bag boy. And all the others would be empty. So he's running up and down that line saying, I got all these lines that are open. And nobody would leave the line because they wanted to get the little message. So it's about how can you make, how can, what can you do to make a difference in the lives of other people? It also can be a, a product. So. Um, so here's a product that a lot of us guys use. Guys, can y'all tell what that is? Can, anybody? Shirt it's a shirt stay. Okay, this is a little plastic one. What do you think this costs? Huh? Ten cents? You know, maybe you go in the store and you buy it, maybe they charge you, you know, a few bucks for it, but it's like really, really inexpensive. So. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to get more profit, so how many of these? If you were the manufacturer of this, how many of these do you think you got to sell to make money? A boatload. That's a boatload of them. So if you wanted upmarket, what would you do? You'd go to the metal ones, right? So if you get a metal one, like if you go into a men's store and you buy a, a, a little package of metal ones, you, you know you'd probably charge you ten, maybe twenty bucks. Now, if you're really smart and you're talking about how do I create more leverage in my product, so this guy created something. So like, I noticed some guys here have their open flaps. And I never liked the way mine kind of did like that because before too long I start sweating and I begin to look like uh, the flying nun. And so I like, not only I like them stiff, but I like them to stick against my shirt. So this guy created this thing called Power Stays. And power stays have a little magnet that they put right there that hold it together. Now, so here's just a little ingenuity. What do you think they charge for power stays? A set of three. Three. A hundred and thirty dollars. So that's where you can take product. Here's another one I love to talk about. This is my wife. So I went to the uh, I went to the store today. I was out of soap. For a dollar twenty-six, I bought a, a, a little thing of of six bars of soap. Soap, 
pretty cheap, true? So if you were going to upmarket that, what would you do? Well, a friend of Kathy's, is she's a very religious and she's a great, I've not met her, but she's, according to Kathy, a great person. She makes soap. And so how much do you think it costs to make a bar of soap? Not too expensive, probably, right? So here's what she does to upmarket. The first thing she does is soap looks kind of cool, and it is uh, it, ha it has a story with it. So uh, I'm thinking about Summer Classics has probably lots of great stories you could build around Summer Classics, and uh, but it has a story with it, and the story is is that it has in it anointed oil, anointed oil. I'm not sure what anointed oil is, but I'm it's oil that somebody's prayed over, and I'm all for that. Uh, it's, this happens to be lavender, so it smells really good, but on the little package here, on the little package is Proverbs, and it's called Refresh. And how much do you think this probably 50 cent bar of soap sells for? Nine bucks. Nine bucks. So when you're thinking about your businesses, how can you create uh, uniqueness in your business? Now here's my, probably my favorite one. This, uh, this guy owns a, 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 owned a company called um, uh, Industrial Specialist Inc. Now here's what they sold. Conveyor belts and a hydraulic. So it was an industrial parts kind of thing. So you go, how, do you, how could you possibly create something unique around that? So here's what he did. I thought this was quite the most bizarre thing I'd ever heard of. So he got, he got private label hot sauce. Private label hot sauce. And, which private label means he does what to it? One of the things, let, would it be okay if I share with you one of ours, something that we developed? And so one of the things that uh, I had a friend of mine, this was a lifelong friend whose father died. And his, di his father was, had created a lot of wealth. And uh, what, here's what I, because he was a really close friend, I got to observe that process, what happened. And because I was in the financial business, I was particularly paying attention to what was happening kind of in, in the settling of the estate. And what I noticed was that this person uh, who was an attorney was really like smart, but not organized. And so the, getting his estate settled was total chaos. And we've got a lot of people in the room. How many of you have been involved in an estate where it was total disarray and it was total chaos. Anybody? Yeah, so a lot of people have seen that. So we looked at that and said, wow, that's a problem that we could solve. And so we studied the probate process. In other words, if somebody what we found, it's almost always a couple. One of the couple, one of the couple almost always really wants to be organized, really wants to have, the, they have this thing that they really want to make sure that they're organized. And so what we have found is that because of the personal handbook, and we do, we take them through a process, but because of the personal handbook, we have our closing ratio of people that come in to visit with us is about 90%. Only about 10% of people that come to see us decide not to do work with us. So it's just a concept there. So. Um, So here, here's my question. What is your unique difference? What is the unique difference that you can create in your company? Or what is the unique difference that you could create as an employee of a company that would make you invaluable to that company? What is that? Billy talked about, uh, Billy talk, opened, opened the session talking about uh, going to uh, uh, was it a four day or four hour? I can't remember what it was, four days, four hour seminar, and walking away with two things. And he, and, but his point was, you learn something, it means nothing if you don't implement. So here's what I would ask you to do, whether you're working for a company or whether you own a company, is to look at this. This is what I've learned from people that are self-made millionaires. You've got you've to stay close to your numbers. Most business owners don't do that. You've got to stay close to your people. A lot of people are good at that. Uh, and then you've got to stay close to your uh, clients or customers, and a lot of people are okay at that. But the people that are the most successful are the ones that drill on that uh, the most. And they also, I think, create some kind of uniqueness about what it is they do. And uh, I want to kind of bring it together with this. 
So here I've got a $50 bill. And this is a $50 bill that I would like to give away. Who wants it? <laughs> give him a round of applause. <laughs> the universe rewards action. Stop talking, start doing. Thank you. <laughs>